Section 37 of Unaddressed Letters by Anonymous Edited by Frank Athelstain Swettenham this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo To Mary in Heaven This is my last letter to you, Karina, and I am writing in the belief that you are in heaven. But are you really there? And if you are, is all well with you? Have you everything you desire and no regrets? It seems such a very long way off. You have such small control over the means of transport, and so much depends on hearsay, that one may, I trust, be pardoned for entertaining doubt where all is so indefinite. Then the accounts of that blessed place that have come to different parts of the world though always inspired, differ so materially. To mortals, immortality is a difficult conception. To finite minds, conscious of the grasp of a limited intelligence, but still very much alive to the evidence of the senses we possess, the idea of a heaven somewhere beyond the reach of earthly imagination is perhaps more difficult still. So many millions come into the world, and we realize fairly well how and why they come. They all, without exception, go, and none ever return. And some, we are told, are in heaven, and some elsewhere. The time here is so absurdly short, and the eternity there is so impossibly long that if our chances of spending the latter in joy or sorrow depend on what we do in the former, it is only natural that this one idea should occupy our thoughts to the exclusion of all others. Yet there, again, we are such frail things that in this way lies what we call madness. If you have solved the great problem can you not enlighten my darkness, my craving for exact knowledge? Write to me, Karina. Write, and tell me what it is all like. If I have wearied you with my feeble little tales, my stupid questions, my pictures that must seem to you so flat and colorless in the glory of that better world, my vain imaginings and my poor human longings. Will you not take pity on me and gladden my weary eyes with a world-painted vision of the heavenly city, the fields of Elysium, or at least the Huris, who are to be the portion of the faithful? I do not know which paradise you are in. See, I wait with a pencil on the paper. Will you not make it right? You do not heed. Perhaps, after all, you are not there. Or is it possible that you have forgotten this small planet and those you left here, and that you find more congenial friends in the company of the angels? I dare say it is natural. I do not upbraid you. But some day I may reach that desired haven, and I want you to remember that I have earned your consideration by my discretion, if you can spare me no more tender feeling. If, for instance, I had sent you these letters while you were still on earth, and you had incautiously left them about, as you would have been certain to do, quite a number of them would have compromised you in the opinion of the servant girl, and she is the origin of a vast deal of earthly gossip. I suppose you have no servant girls and no gossip where you are. The absence of effect, depending on the want of cause, 
happy heaven and yet i believe that there are people on this earth who really enjoy being the subject of gossip to them the suggestions of scandal are as the savour of salt as danger is to the sportsman the wilder the suggestion the more amusing the game and there are even those who when tattle wanes and desire fails say or insinuate to their own detriment the thing that is not rather than disappear into obscurity it is the same desire for notoriety and attention which prompted martin to set fire to york minister and led the woman to complain to the vicar that her husband had ceased to beat her up in the serene atmosphere of those heavenly heights you have no cathedrals no husbands no wives no work no play no food no frocks pardon me that is a slip of the pen of course you have frocks but what else have you is it not sometimes just a little monotonous if life is so short that it amounts to little more than the constant fear of coming death are you not sometimes overawed by the contemplation of eternity but after all the dwellers in heaven may never think never to remember and so never to regret never to think and so never to desire that is a possible scheme of existence where a thousand years might be as one day and to the weary it would mean rest but so would oblivion and we are not altogether satisfied with the thought of oblivion oh threats of hell and hopes of paradise one thing is certain this life flies one thing is certain and the rest is lies the flower that once has blown for ever dies that is well enough but it is not an inspired writing it is a cry rather of despair than conviction and oft repeated to make up for want of certainty of things mundane we have acquired a tolerable knowledge however much there is yet to be learnt but that in us which we call the soul will never be satisfied till it learns something of the hereafter who will teach it do we know more now than they did when men fought with bows and arrows or flint weapons instead of a hundred ton guns fired by electricity standing alone in some vast solitude where man and his doings have no part have made no mark and left no trace where face to face with nature with mountain and plain forest and sea and a limitless firmament man's somewhat puny efforts are forgotten there comes an intense longing for something higher and nobler than the life we live the soul of man cries out for light for some goal towards which he may by effort and sacrifice attain for he is not lacking in the qualities that have made heroes and martyrs throughout all the ages if he cannot rend the veil and scale the heights of heaven he can grasp the things within his reach and realizing that there are problems beyond his intelligence he can yet give his life to make easier the lot of his fellow creatures seeking humbly but courageously to follow no matter how far behind in the footsteps of his great exemplar nor need his efforts be less strenuous his object less worthy because this passionate cry of a voice stilled centuries ago strikes a sympathetic chord in his heart yet ah 
that spring should vanish with a rose that youth's sweet-scented manuscript should close the nightingale that in the branches sang ah whence and whither flown again who knows would but the desert of the fountain yield one glimpse if dimly yet indeed revealed to which the fainting traveller might spring as springs the trampled herbage of the field would but some winged angel ere too late arrest the yet unfolded roll of fate and make the stern recorder otherwise in register or quite obliterate ah love could you and i with him conspire to grasp this sorry scheme of things entire would not we shatter it to bits and then remould it near to the heart's desire end of section 37 End of Unaddressed Letters by Anonymous Edited by Frank Athelstane Swettenham Section 26 of Unaddressed Letters by Anonymous Edited by Frank Athelstane Swettenham This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eva Davis A Love Filter there is to me something strangely attractive about Mohammedan prayers, especially those fixed for the hour of sunset. Time and again I have gone in with the faithful when the priest chants the mazin, and I have sat by and been deeply impressed by the extraordinary reverence of the worshippers, while eye and ear have been captivated by the picturesque figures against their colorful background, the wonderfully musical intoning of the priest, and the not less harmonious responses. I do not pretend that this oft-repeated laudation of God's name, this adoration by deep, sonorous words and by every bodily attitude that can convey profound worship, would appeal to others as it does to me, even when I have to guess at the exact meaning of prayers whose general import needs no interpretation. The fifth hour of prayer follows closely on that fixed for sundown, and the interval is filled up by singing hymns of praise led by the priest, or by telling and listening to stories of olden times. Of eastern places, the Malay Peninsula has special attractions for me, and the few European travellers I met there, and who, like myself, were not bound to a programme, seemed equally fascinated. Most of them either prolonged their stay or determined to return for a longer visit. It is difficult to say exactly wherein lies the spell but there are beauties of scenery, the undoubted charm of the people, as distinguished from other Easterns, and the sense of mystery, of exclusiveness, of unspoilt nature and undescribed life that arouse a new interest in the wearied children of the West. It is pleasant to get at something which is not to be found in any encyclopedia, and it is, above all, gratifying to obtain knowledge direct and at the fountainhead, this is why I often return, in thought, to the narrow land that lies between two storm-swept seas, itself more free from violent convulsions than almost any other. There is perpetual summer, no volcanoes, no earthquakes, no cyclones. Even the violence of the monsoons that lash the China Sea and the India Ocean into periodical fury is largely spent before it reaches the unprotected seaboards of the richly dowered peninsula. Forgive this digression. I was sitting with the faithful, and the first evening prayer was over. The brief twilight was fast deepening into night. The teacher excused himself, and the disciples pushed themselves across the floor till they could sit with their backs against the wall, leaving two rows of prayer carpets to occupy the middle of the room. I had asked some question which, in a roundabout way, led to the telling of this tale. "'I remember all about it,' said a man, sitting in the corner. He was a stranger, a man of Sumatra, called Nakada Mawin, and he gave the girl a love potion that drove her mad. He was a trader from Batubara, and he had been selling the famous silks of his country in the villages up our river. Having exhausted his stock and collected his money, 
he embarked in his boat and made his way to the mouth of the river every boat going to sea had to take water on board and there were two places where you could get it one was at telugbatu on our coast and the other was on an island hard by but in those days the strait between the coast and the island was a favourite haunt of pirates and nakada mawin made for telugbatu to get his supply of fresh water he was in no hurry a week or a month then made no difference so he first called on the chief of the place a man of importance styled to permitang and then he began to think about getting the water now it happened that to permitang had four daughters and the youngest but one a girl called rahuna was very beautiful when there is a girl of uncommon beauty in a place people talk about it and no doubt the nakada idling about heard the report and managed to get sight of rauna at once he fell in love with her and set about thinking how he could win her though she was already promised in marriage to another these sumatra people know other things besides making silk and daggers and nakara mawin had a love filter of the most potent kind it was made from the tears of the sea woman who we call juyong i know the creature i have seen it it is bigger than a man and something like a porpoise it comes out of the sea to eat grass and if you lie and wait for it you can catch it and take the tears some people eat the flesh it is red like the flesh of a buffalo and the tears are red and if you mix them with rice they make the rice red at least people say so anyhow nakara mawin had the filter and he got an old woman to needle the way for him as one always does and she managed to mix the duyong's tears with rauna's rice and when the girl had eaten it she was mad with love for the nakada he stayed at telugbatu for a month making excuses but all to be with rauna and he saw her every day with the help of the old woman of course you can't go on like that for long without some one suspecting something and though i never heard for certain that there was anything really wrong the girl was mad and reckless and the nakada took fright she was a chief's daughter while he was a traitor and a stranger and he knew they would kill him without an instant's hesitation if to permatang so much as suspected what was going on therefore having got the water on board the nakada put to sea saying nothing to any one in a little place people talk of little things and some one said in the hearing of rahuna that the Batubara trader had sailed away. With a cry of agony, the girl dashed from the house, her sisters after her, and seeing the boat sailing away, but still at no great distance, for there was little breeze, she rushed into the sea and made frantic efforts to tear herself from the restraining arms of her sisters, who could barely prevent her from drowning herself. At the noise of all this uproar, a number of men ran down to the shore and when they saw and heard what was the matter they shouted to the nakada to put back again he knew better than to thrust his neck into the noose and though they pursued his boat they failed to catch him when rauna saw that she could not get to her lover and that each moment was carrying him farther away she cried to him to return and bursting into sobs she bemoaned her abandonment and told her tale of love and words of endearment and despair that passed into a song which to this day is known as rahuna's lament yes i can remember the verses and will repeat them if it does not weary you the nakada never returned o oh, shelter my dear shelter the palm stands in the plain the fruit of the nutmeg falls to the ground and lies there thine is thy sister small but comely thy diamond the light of permitang guntong oh my shelter i hear the measured splash of the oars i see the driftweed caught in the rudder thou art above my protecting shelter i am beneath in lowly worship oh my shelter twas the hour of evening prayer when thou settest sail the oars are straining and the boat reels along god's mercy is great his promise sure by his blessing we shall meet in the garden of paradise o oh, my shelter the breeze is blowing in fitful gusts be careful not to pull the sail to the left in three months and ten days thou wilt return my brother 
O oh, my shelter, make for the island Sri Ram, for there are two maraboots and a fish weir. Though thou leavest me, be not long absent. In two, at most in three months, return again. O oh, my shelter, the waters of the sea are calm, yet do not hug the shore. Have no fear of my betrothed. Was not thy sword but lately sharpened? O oh, my shelter, thou camest to Telegbatu, and the peace of my heart has gone. 